Hello, David McMillan here, smuggler for over 40 years and unfortunately trapped in various prisons and hell holes for, well, not quite half of that time, but for long enough. But today, I don't want to talk about all the grim stuff, but about concealing things. Now, a while back, I spoke about concealing things in general, hiding things around the house, uh, making little snatches. But the real business of smuggling, through airports anyway, was making something that would get through. Now, a lot of people think that it's the object itself that is the key. And I certainly thought that to be the case. I mean, it's got a history that goes way back. Not often very well understood. You know, there were a, a friend of mine uh, was trying to help me while I was locked up somewhere. Um, I was in Pakistan, and he was running around, and he was a guest of some, uh, well, some quite big smugglers. But he thought he'd get a little bit of dope, and uh, he'd work out some way of getting it out himself. Now, bear in mind old Harry there, he, he was not a smuggler. He hadn't been in the trade. And his, well, he was a bank robber, if you must know, and a pretty damn good one, but very huh, straight-line thinking. He did come up with an idea, and he was so coy, and rather proud about what it was, he didn't tell me. Do you know what it was? Yeah, it was a, a porcelain statue. Now, out of all the possible things to smuggle something in, you wouldn't do that. That idea's been around since, well, I guess since there were border checks. Of course it didn't make it. It was small and of not great value. Uh, I think it was just something that he could do because he wasn't helping me very much with getting out of the prison. He was supposed to be there managing the payment of bribes, but um, I think perhaps um, a bank robber is not necessarily the person you need to read through character. After all, he's only looking for fear in people's faces, I guess. Or obedience at the end of a gun. But no, I started with something that was probably not much better than a porcelain statue. But it was my first. So, let's take a look at the object I chose. And by the way, I suppose looking back, I could see this as... A story of a life in ten objects. I know there's been a few people who've put out uh, memoirs, their life in ten LP albums, uh, or ten books, or ten something or other. Things that influenced their life or became markers in their long span of years. And these aren't music albums, but these are items that I've spied out and I thought they were quite good. I had a friend, you know, who was a, a fellow smuggler. We were walking down a, a shopping street in, in Germany, in Berlin, and we had been so deeply entrenched in smuggling with objects, we could barely look at anything in the shops without imagining it packed with powder or stashed with bricks of hash or some device in it. And we laughed at each other when uh, seeing that in our faces. Oh, contemptible? Yes, but not without some interest. So we'll start kind of backwards on this list. Number one is not the top thing. Number one is probably the worst idea anybody has ever survived. And had it not worked, it wouldn't be on this list. So let's take a look at the damn thing. We'll start off early in time, and I guess early in equipment. It was a last-minute thing, but it seemed to have worked, but only just. The Grundig Radio from the 1950s. How did it come about that I was uh, lugging around this 1950s Grundig Radio? Well, I'd been... I'd gone to India. Why? Because all my crooked friends, uh, safecrackers at the time, had recommended... Uh, bringing in a load of hash, well, really, that should be by the ship. And you can't get much through by plane, but 
uh, bear in mind this was uh, what uh, mid to towards the late seventies, so things were a little looser. And the plan was to go to India, get the hash, and come back to Sydney, get through with it. Now I had quite, I suppose you could call it a good plan, complex and bound to fail, because I didn't know India very well, and I didn't quite understand how, well, how intense everything would be in a jangling, confusing, steamy sort of way. The original plan to get the hash out of India was this. I had built uh, a piece of television equipment. It wasn't a signal processor. Pretty clunky, you can imagine, in the 70s. I mean, this was the era when recordings were made not onto solid-state memories, but on tape, and big, thick, two-inch tape. And it needed quite powerful machines to run. So I bought um, some piece of equipment. It was a big brick of a thing. Well, more than that. Uh, um, probably about uh, two feet along one side, another two feet on another, heavy as hell. It must have weighed about 40 kilos as it was. Anyway, in Melbourne, I stripped this down and added in a compartment 10 kilos of lead. Why? Because I wanted the weight of it to match as it was sent out as a sample of television equipment and then brought back in. So the weight would be the same, only the idea was that the lead would be taken out and the hash put in. Sounds all right on paper, but on landing in India, it was all quite different. I don't know quite how to describe the atmosphere in the technical world, but they had black and white television and were sort of struggling to make something of it. It's so far from what it is today. There were departments and bureaucracy and, and many things like that. I thought I could land at the airport with my big clunking bit of machinery and um, fill out a form, take it with me, saying, look, it's for demonstration only. I don't need to pay duty on it. Now, here was the thing. I'd put the value on it quite high so that when the uh, machine was returned to Sydney, they w customs would look at it and think, well, this is a valuable piece of equipment. Well, why would it be messed with? Now, that was a big mistake. Because, of course, when I arrived and then went around to the cargo section where it had been sent before in New Delhi and presented it to the customs officer there, I mean, I was, I was barely 20 years old. I had no idea of how the world worked, probably anywhere, but much less India. The officer there, a big pork belly, he looked at it, mostly the figures on the documentation, and saw a great opportunity for a $10,000 machine that I wanted to bring into his country duty-free. Oh, no, 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 he said. You'll have to leave a big deposit on that. A what? Yeah. Uh, the idea was that if I wanted to take it and show it anywhere, I would need to um, put down some kind of security so that I wouldn't sell it on and avoid the duty. How was I going to get around that? Well, the first thought was, uh, and the recommendation from somebody, I think, in the uh, one of the trade commissions, was to go to the television networks, well, there was only one, the state-run network, and get a kind of letter of invitation from them. Well, <laughs> I tried that. I went to a, a sprawling old colonial-era building with some officers in there, not much sign of any television work going on. I couldn't see any studios connected with it. But I also, I couldn't see any people. If there were staff around there, they weren't visible. They were pretty much at lunch or having a siesta or something. When I finally found somebody who had, I guess, some kind of official position, I presented my phony credentials as an engineer and he kind of looked at me and said, well, you know, we, 
we make our own things here. We, we don't need to import equipment. And uh, well, the things we do, we, we know in advance. It, it was starting to become very clear to me that not only was this a waste of time, but of course, even though I knew the equipment they used in the television network was actually all imported, you, can you imagine how it was done? It would have been a deal. There would have been payoffs down the line. <clears throat> Unless I started talking about uh, some direct benefit to uh, the guy concerned at the station, he wasn't going to send me some kind of letter of authority to clear this bit of test equipment through customs. Not a chance. And he looked at me as though I was so naive because I should have known before that that was my problem, getting it in. Well, we had a pleasant enough afternoon, and I guess looking back on it, I, I quite liked the atmosphere. It was a very quiet town, in a way, New Delhi back then. I was staying at the Ashoka Hotel, running up a bill, and uh, went to the Trade Commission. I went to the Australian Trade Commission because the British one really didn't want to know. But the Australians were always more friendly, and they had a, quite a nice house in the diplomatic enclave there. Um, actually designed by somebody well-known in Australia. It was, it was well done. And the guy in the Trade Commission, he sat back in his chair and said, look, I think you're up against it, mate. Um, I'll give you a letter. And he more or less tried to help me by giving me an introduction letter saying, uh, Freddie here, that was me, is well known in the Australian television engineering sections and woof, 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 all of that. And he produced a whole lot of rubber stamps and in a very patronizing way, used different inks all over them, saying, well, they, they like a lot of this. Yeah, maybe so, maybe not. But I don't think all the colorful stamps on that letter was going to make a damn bit of difference to a naive half-wit such as I was. Of course, I, I left the Trade Commission, presented my bits of letters, and got absolutely nowhere. There was no way I was going to free my smuggling device, my big chunk of electrical equipment with its 10 kilos of lead inside, which I was supposed to change for the hashish, which I hadn't got anyway. Well, I wasn't going to get it. Oh, and did I tell you? I was doing this without any money, or almost no money. So, what to do next? Uh, the only thing was to abandon entirely the television equipment plan. I'd have to find something else to uh, put my hash in. Oh, one other thing. I didn't have any connection. Well, I had sort of a connection there. Mm. Ah, where to begin with that one? Well, there was an Australian bank robber and uh, General Scallywag who had left the country under a cloud and had uh, been hiding out with the Hare Krishna group at their ashram uh, somewhere down near a beachside suburb of Melbourne. I knew he'd gone to India, so I went down there. Mm, I knew some of the guys. Oh yes, I'm sure there were Hare Krishna people there that were not criminals, uh, not on the run, not wanted. But those were not the ones I was interested in. So I got a couple of names, not his exactly, not his new name. And that took me, if we transform myself back into India, to the ashram in New Delhi, where I hoped to meet the right person. Well, who did I meet? I met an American expat and his wife who told me about uh, living in the ashram, something unclear about uh, husband and wife not having sex. He did look kind of stressed. But really the only, well, the only great event of the afternoon that I was given an audience for an hour or so with his divine grace, Sri, well, I should really know, I'm sure he's dead now, as most of the people are in my stories, but um, I sat amongst about 40 people as the Great One, 
sat on a kind of dais, a big wooden platform. He actually travelled the world with this platform. The thing is, he said nothing. I think he scratched his belly, ordered a Coca-Cola, and mumbled something or other to an assistant. So where did my mind wander? To the object upon which he sat, the great wooden dais. How much hash would that hold? How much would that cost? Was he doing it? Well, I kind of hinted around some of these things to the American expat, who gave me a few clues. Looked me up and down, but probably thought, no, if I'm going to go that way, get involved in a smuggling operation, this Pratt isn't the one I'm going to do it with. But as I say, he was quite stressed, so that was a loose end there. I'd have to find somewhere else. So I began my search for my hashish in the place which I am quite familiar, the gutter, or not quite, but the pavement, the shoeshine boys. I really only went for a shoeshine, but uh, that was to relax myself because I'd just been fleeced of a couple of hundred dollars by some swindlers hanging around the Amex um, money-changing office. Uh, I won't go into that. It's a funny enough story. But um, I, I should say this. Don't... Um, if, you, if you go off-site for money-changing... Uh, try and stay in somebody's office. If you find yourself round the back of a block of apartments uh, with one guy counting out the money in front of your face, uh, it's not going to be all it's supposed to be. Well, I caught on to it before I uh, lost too much. Why? Oh, because the man who came out on the balcony screaming, what's going on here? You criminals are always hanging around the back. I'm calling the police. Halfway through the switch, I realized, why would he be saying this in English unless I was the intended audience? Mm. I was late to catch up, but I did, and I hung on to my money, and, well, I went back to relax with the shoeshine boys. And they bought me a bit of low-grade hash, but it wasn't until by chance that I found somebody who would be helpful. I was running out of money, and my backer at the time had to send me some, which was quite an ordeal back in the 70s to India. It took a few days, and lots of stuff, lots of sitting around offices of banks to get the thing. Now, it was there that I met the guy who became my first hashish connection in India. He was collecting some money from somebody, so he had friends overseas. But he wasn't actually much of a crook. We got talking, and uh, as we waited for our far-flung funds, and uh, as I nudged the conversation towards you know, things underhanded, he spoke of stealing silk scarves through a window with a coat hanger. Yes, I'd have to plump this guy up to get anywhere. Well, um, I'll cut through a bit here. I did, and he did, and he managed to get me six kilos. But this story is about where to stash it, how to smuggle it. I didn't have anything, and I didn't have time because my visa was running out to get too fancy to start building things. No delay could be brooked in this case. We looked around his uh, family's house, and poked over in the corner was an old 1950s Grundig radio. Mm, wide, about six or seven inches high. Uh, something that would probably go well on eBay these days. So that was it. He gave me the six kilos and uh, his best wishes and the Grundig radio, which I took back to the Shoka Hotel and went to work. Now, it might have been big and clunky and old, but the six kilos barely fit inside. And you know what? I couldn't find any cling film in the 70s. Uh, perhaps I should have gone back to the technicians at the television channel. Nope. Wrapped in, uh, well, cellophane, 
and taped up to conceal the smell. It just about wedged into this machine, though it kind of curved the top and bottom. That went into a suitcase, uh, wrapped in a towel to, what, keep it comfortable, and I stepped onto the plane, headed back to Sydney. What would happen there? I landed at Sydney. Now, bear in mind, they don't, well, they didn't have the complicated, uh, thoughtful systems for checking passengers they do today. In fact, um, they had it in a slight way. Okay, when you present your passport to the immigration officer, he refers you to, um, with a card, with a notation on it, that's for a check or not a check. Um, of course, coming from India, and I was traveling on a British passport at the time, uh, in my own name, actually. God, never again after that. I was referred to the checking desk. Um, it was manned by one fatherly figure. He kind of looked me up and down, and we opened the case. He lifted the towel and uh, asked me to take the radio out. I think in that suitcase, uh, it wasn't very big, um, there was just this big radio, the towel, a couple of pairs of socks, some underwear, and I think a shirt. Oh, yes, and some sandals. Well, he asked me this, bearing in mind that I'm barely 20. He said, is this your first trip there? Yes, I said. Well, well, I say he was a fatherly type. He spoke to me. Listen, son, um, are you going back there, are you? No, 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 no. He looked at the radio, spun the tuning dial. Now, because I had eviscerated the entire innards of this radio, the dial just spun and spun until entropy and... Newtonian mechanics slowed it down. He knew perfectly well that whatever the hell was in there was certainly not tubes, not of that kind. He looked around to see if anybody was watching. He said, well, take your radio, shall we call it, take it, son, and get going, and... Don't do this again. Well, somehow, I chose to misinterpret that as not for the clear warning that it was, but um, what could he have meant? Don't underpack my suitcase. Don't leave the country with only one pair of underwear and a pair of socks. <sighs> and take your sandals with you. I trotted out of the airport that day, thinking myself the most wonderful smuggler extraordinaire. <sighs> I was saved, or was I condemned? It, clearly, the old gent simply didn't want to go through with an arrest that day. And Sydney was the place to do it back in the 70s. If they didn't like you, they'd make something of it, but... He just didn't care. He wanted an easy life and wanted to get home. But as I say, I bounced out, and I thought, did I think that Grundig radio was a wonderful device? No, I knew perfectly well it was a piece of shit, and I was insane to do it. But I had no real choice except to surrender. And as you'll see, surrendering is not something that I'll do easily. Not when infamy, greed, vanity, arrogance, not when all those things are at play, and certainly when you're 20, what the hell anyway? So let's see what I chose next. It's hard to shake an idea, even when it shouldn't have worked, but at number two was an improvement to the stereo system, and mainly down to Woodcraft the 1970s stereo amp. Well, my uh, underworld uh, 
safe-cracking connections in Melbourne, were so astonished that I'd actually got through with anything, or perhaps even more astonished that I'd gone, and my backer, that uh, they, well, they didn't know why the hell I didn't go all the way to, uh, well, go to Thailand by heroin. Now, heroin, they'd condemned that. Everybody had said this was untouchable, that there was no respect in the criminal world if... Well, you've heard the speech before, but the profits were high, so... And I'd used it myself and uh, got a couple of little habits along the way, so I knew all about it. But anyway, this story is not uh, yet another discussion. This is about objects, objects of desire and of concealment. So, did I walk away from radio sets? No, I did not. I thought, and I, I think we all do, that we can simply improve on what we did previously. Improve on that and somehow make it work. And I went to town. Yes, I worked in the wooden surrounds of the 1970s style of stereo amplifier. They had the virtue that the electronics were light, but the casings were quite strong, and often in a wood veneer. Where'd I go with that? A friend with, uh, who was a good hand in the, the wood workshop, showed me about how to build things, but he impressed me with how he could put the veneer down on the sides of these tuners. The trick was to put the edges so that they you couldn't see the glue line. In other words, the wooden surround would appear solid wood, and the way to do that was to pack it in very tight. I built the things, and of course they were hollow as they went over to Thailand. Inside was the money, all folded up, kind of neat. Now, I wouldn't recommend any of this uh, to anybody these days, if only for the reason that uh, a lot of luggage is x-rayed just going out. It wasn't so much then. And folded up money inside some electronic components. Well, the fact is you would not be flying around um, from most countries with big bulky bits of stereo equipment in there. You might send it by cargo, but that's another matter. If we got into the shipping world, well, it's wide open. Almost anything can happen, but we're still at airports. Now, the improved tuners um, work well because the dope is organic. The wood's organic. It shows up yellow on the x-rays. So it doesn't stand out, but <clears throat> it still needs to be packed edge to edge with no odd shapes inside. So when I'd opened the things up, peel back the veneer strips, take out the money, set them aside, that would disappear up to Chiang Mai and a couple of weeks later the dope would come down. The Thai dope at the time was all light and fluffy like white coffee granules, so it had to be compressed. I didn't like really mistreating it in that way. Uh, there was something like harming it, but that was a particular perversity of uh, my love of it back then. Anyway, it got squashed into the sides of the tuners, I put the veneer down, I made the glue seal almost imperceptible and packed it in. They worked well for me, they worked well for couriers. Okay, there was a, a bomb scare at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam and all the luggage was offloaded. Uh, it went through an x-ray machine, but as I say, there's nothing to distinguish it. Sure, you'll see lots of pictures, even today, of um, bits of equipment, bits of wood, where there's an anomaly, an inconsistency. But um, with the right kinds of heavy timber, and most of the powders, uh, cocaine, heroin, they won't show up, especially if it's edge to edge. So that lasted quite a while and, incidentally, made me a fortune. But that was going to come to an end. Soon enough, T 
terrorists began blowing things up with bits of electronic equipment. And that wasn't good for anybody. Certainly not the people who got blown up, but uh, down the line, the humble uh, smuggler through airports had to think of something else. So where to go? Take to the books is the advice for all young men and young women too. And I certainly did. But at number three, bookbinding, the paper. Well, it's been around for a while, as long as chemistry. And it seems to have worked, mostly. The third thing on this list of ten objects that uh, decorated my career are books. Sure, the reading of a few flight manuals helped, but books have been used for smuggling uh, for many years, mostly for hidden documents in the spy game, but also for drugs of various kinds. I've seen hash packed into the covers of uh, books and gone on their way. It doesn't really work because it's very hard to conceal the smell of hash in, in, in books. But there was another technique, and that involves soaking the paper. You can dissolve, as you'll come to see, um, good quality cocaine in alcohol very easily, and it becomes a um, almost clear yellow liquid. If that is soaked into the pages of a book, well, you don't do it in, in the book itself. You'd have to take the entire thing apart, soak the pages, dry them out, roll them flat again, and bind the book once more. You Sure, you could cut around the edges of the heavy cover, but that would show up. That's a kind of hairline, well, certainly a few millimeters of uh, a shadow there that would, would attract attention. But the soaked books were a kind of time-honored thing. It didn't really amount to much. The quantity is so small. Just for interest's sake, um, if you've got a book weighing a kilo, you'd be lucky to get 100 grams into it. So it's a, a hobby thing, a kind of, um, I don't know, I half expect to see a, a YouTube video about it one day by some uh, scrappy-looking carpenter out in his shed. He might do it, but there was a, a lot of them around. But we can say this about books. Though frequently used, also frequently intercepted. Strike them off your list. Smuggling stash number four has been around pretty much as long as there's been chemistry. And bottles of alcohol with a bit of an additive have crossed many an airport. The fourth item on the list is something for the smuggler who hasn't got much time, doesn't mind a certain level of risk, and it's bottles of alcohol. Now, as I've said, Cocaine dissolves very readily in alcohol, and it goes almost clear. Of course, it might work with a white wine, but it, a liqueur is better. It's less likely to be um, opened up, um, and there's a method to uh, deal with that particular problem. Most of the liqueur bottles um, had a, a false barrier in the neck, so the dissolved coke would go inside to the bottle and then a, a plastic insert would sit in the neck of it. And some genuine, um, well, what would it be, orange curacao, something distinctive, uh, would go in the top part of it. But bear in mind that dissolves rather, well, not dissolves, it actually evaporates kind of too quickly. And then there's the matter of putting the seal back on it. So quite a bit of work. And... It has to be done very well to look effective. Nonetheless, quite a lot of it goes around. The basis of uh, the amount of coke per litre would be no more than 300 grams per litre, just in case you were curious. They travel all around the world, these bottles. 
They mostly get through, oddly enough. But it's kind of small beer. I mean, would you want a suitcase with ten bottles in there? Oh, yes, plus a towel and socks and underwear. No, you wouldn't. But I mention it because it's always there and often done. If you want to know the history of these things, of course, which is why we're here. This next one, number five, came to me out of need and necessity, the best drivers for innovation. A glass bird with some changes and brought about because everybody seemed to know what I was doing. This uh, grand bit of glass sculpture I'm going on about, uh, I think, uh, what is it, number five here, isn't it? Yes. Um, well, this came up because some people had come to know um, uh, that I was uh, smuggling in these stereo tuners. Mm, okay, not the authorities, but people who would be a nuisance. So after a bit of misleading, I made it appear as though the operation had failed and I was limping home empty-handed, without cargo, as they say. Um, but I hadn't been. I had dissolved the cocaine in to a pretty heavy ratio. As, as you add the alcohol, it goes into a paste. In fact, it's been used uh, to mimic shampoo. It can be of that kind of consistency. But at about a um, <clears throat> three to one basis, uh, it can be quite a clear and uh, without particle yellow liquid. In this case, I had a glass sculpture of a bird and had drilled a tiny hole into it. In fact, you would need to drill two holes, one to inject the liquid and another one to take the displaced air as it bubbles out. If you don't do that, you'll end up with these bubbles going through the thick liquid that you just won't be able to shake out. And after all, it needs to look as though it's solid glass. After all, the weight will be <coughs> certainly that of solid glass. So weight matches object. That's something else to remember. It did quite well, but I never used it again because I kept imagining, and I was fretting, that the poor bird would get a crack in its neck, and that would be an unhappy outcome for everyone. But it looked good, and it worked. As I say, it wouldn't be on this list if it didn't. Forget the high life, forget high tech, forget any kind of life. At number six, the Kamikaze Run, and it lives up to its name. I should take a moment out here at... Uh, and number six, to talk about uh, the kind of people who didn't fuss too much with the technicalities. They weren't looking for great objects of concealment. They really weren't trying to fool anybody. They went on what were call, called kamikaze runs. Um, oddly enough, they were the kind of people who'd usually uh, swallowed it or stuck it up their bum in condoms. They didn't even bother with that, but it's worth mentioning because, oddly enough, about out of every, what, out of every five uh, attempts at just rolling up a kilo of whatever it is, throwing it in your suitcase and jumping on the plane, out of every five, mm, up until the mid-90s, uh, more than half would get through. Uh, I, okay, it helps to have a couple of transit connections. Um, the guy I'm thinking of took his kilo, which he was supposed to pack this way and that, and strap it to his body. He couldn't be bothered. He, he rolled it up in a pair of Levi's, threw it in his suitcase in Costa Rica, jumped on the plane, and came back to Europe. And it was fine. It kind of made us all feel that the whole thing was pointless, all this nonsense we were going on with making little devices and things. Of course, the kamikaze pilot had uh, 
<laughs> in, in the drug smuggling world had some of the same features. No parachute and uh, the door is locked from outside, just as on the old planes. <laughs> Only worth mentioning because somebody will want to know how many times you're likely to get through if you just throw it in a suitcase. Well, um, probably once back in the day. What's the word for it now? Nuns? <laughs> Kamikaze indeed. <laughs> They'd even be suspicious as to why you did it. They'd send for a psych report for sure when it came time for sentencing. But it was done. Why is it that shoes have been used for smuggling for so long? I think simply because they're at the bottom, they're at the floor. The dream is nobody will look down. But at number seven, they've been working for me. <laughs> well, for many people for a long time. The history of uh, smuggling things in shoes goes way back. And uh, I suppose it probably began with smuggling precious metals. I know that a few friends had been smuggling um, gold from India at the time of the, the 70s, and it's only natural that drugs would end up in there sooner or later. They don't hold much, but I've seen people get away with um, up to a kilo, not in each shoe, that's pushing it, but a little of, I think a kilo point four was about the, the maximum manageable but it's still a bit of a shuffle. Of course, you need then to take into account um, what's going to happen boarding planes. The whole thing went out the window with the terrorists and the shoe bombers. Richard Reed kind of destroyed something that, uh, well, it was never a great idea, but it was a small cottage industry for those in need. And I've met many a passenger with those heavy shoes on planes. And it's a bit of fun to watch them shuffle off and see how they do. But Richard, you did your bit in the drug wars. I'll say this. <laughs> As we go up in number, at number eight, it gets technical here. Plastics and what you can do with them. And it was really the Colombians who put some serious work into this stuff. Take a look. Here's a thing worth knowing, uh, if you care, about... Um, cocaine made into plastics by the alcohol evaporation technique, you have to bring it back. Oddly enough, it's perfectly straightforward. And the bits of plastic are, are broken up, um, often in a coffee grinder, then dissolved um, in alcohol. The plastic and the fibers separate because their, their fiber-like integrity has actually stayed as such so they can be filtered out from that alcohol liquid mix. Once filtered, then the alcohol is just evaporated down, or ev evaporated away, I should say, uh, leaving the uh, white creamy paste. Of course, this needs to be done away from a naked flame, yes. Um, so electric stoves are used there, glass containers, and Finally, a little finish in the microwave, just 10 second bursts, not too much. A couple of friends have kind of blown up their kitchens with uh, um, getting a bit, well, impatient, is it? Instead of 10 second bursts, they'd go to 30 and suddenly the fumes would ignite. But it's um, a bit of an art in itself. On a big glass bowl, that uh, cocaine crystallizes around the edge like a fine phyllo pastry. It can be scraped off. Damn it, makes you want to buy it that way if you could. Certainly that, what is it, necrescence, that opalescent color and effect, that's so visible then. Yes, it doesn't really flake though, but it's a good thing to watch. And seems to take longer as you keep checking it out to see whether it's working. <laughs> Big sniff all round. But 
As I say, the process is perfectly straightforward, even though a couple of scoundrels have dressed up in white outfits and used thermometers and make a big fuss of it. Uh, but it really could be done by any decent kitchen cook. Those plastics they had their day, everything from the dinner plates made in uh, Lebanon way back to just about anything that be, could, be con could be called plastic. I was just thinking, yeah, it was even made into um, um, things like plastic flexible belts and um, I saw a basket woven out of um, kind of tubes of this plastic. You can't get um, bright light colours, but still, it feels right. Works damn well too. I haven't seen the last of that around and I, I don't think we'll see the last of that. But it's not a big importer's thing. Once again, we're dealing in the world of the independent smuggler. Really, the coal face of the industry. So where to next? Number nine is a variation of the body pack, but quite a good one. And it was refined in South America so that even the couriers felt a little confident. And certainly by the time they landed. They were sweating underneath, where it couldn't be seen. So, on the same theme, what about if we keep our dissolved cocaine as a, as a liquid, or as a paste, or a gel? Well, as I said before, it's gone into a few shampoo bottles, but th this is dangerous business, and the, well, the nab rate, the arrest rate, always very high on that. But then came up, and again from South America, the Jelly Belly. Yep. Little sealed sacks, or kind of one big one, really, to go around. What, a skinny man? No, you've got to have a bit of genuine fat neck to wear the Jelly Belly. It'd be a strap-on, about uh, four, sometimes five kilos, right around the middle. And here's the key to it. It's not just the stuff itself. It has to be held in firmly or it'll sag with a kind of shoulder strap out of a thin plastic again. But over that goes a little layer of sponge and then some latex. And here's the thing. It's got to feel like a belly. It's got to push in and spring out. So not only does it do that, but the recommendation to uh, the guys running around in their jelly bellies is to wear something like, well, the Hawaiian tourist shirt, but perhaps a size or two too small, so it's stretching at the buttons. That way, when they get the inevitable check from a source country, they get patted down. Nobody thinks there's anything under there but blubber. It's very uncomfortable, I should say, for the couriers. They feel absolutely exposed in that. They're wearing this thing, they can feel it, the added weight. Even if they were fat guts beforehand, they'd feel, well, they're sweating. But here's the good thing. They were fat guys anyway. They sweat all the time. So what difference would it make? No, many of those guys have, have got through quite well. And quite a few women, I should say. That, uh, of course, it, it doesn't work for the pregnancy thing. No, the, I, as a kind of sidebar footnote here, I should say that the smugglers who've been using uh, fake pregnancies uh, invariably get taken away by a female officer and they have to take off their clothes. Now, the jelly belly only works for the genuine fat slob. Works like a charm, though. But, of course, it's against the law, I should say. Did I mention that? Number 10. And last on the list, well, we'll call them the trolley walk. And trolleys it is. Trolleys full of suitcases. Or just a few. But really, this is a transformation in style. We're going into the psychology of smuggling. At number 10 here, and my final bit of concealment for this episode, we've got pictures of suitcases on trolleys and the trolley itself. So where is this leading? Well, here's the thing. All of this stuff, all of these boxes and objects and 
devices and concealments don't mean a damn thing compared compared to the compared to the image compared to the information that comes with every passenger where he or she has come from is it a source country or not what their passport says is it nicely used and beaten up if they're a frequent traveler does it have stamps for other places or is it a terrible first time passport straight to a source country passport that will bound to attract a check no really the background of the traveler is 10 times as important as the device you can sit at home and dream up the most ingenious method of concealing something and it may work but the point is customs people policemen they look at the person, not the thing. There was hardly anything left by the time I ended my career which would be an object enough, impenetrable enough, to survive a basic suspicion about that person. But there was one thing. I came in once, knew I was going to get hit, was taken into a room with my trolley full of bags. I was checked, the bags were checked, every object in the bag was checked. I was searched, my shoes were checked. They didn't send me for an x-ray, but that's probably because I sat there wolfing down any snack or drink they'd bring. No, they had to let me go, and I stacked my bags back on that uh, trolley and tootled out. And tootled out with almost two kilos. How? And this method, the final one, goes to the heart of good smuggling. The device was not in the suitcases. It was not on my person. It was not in the bag, although it was on a suit carrier at one stage. You know the kind of um, fold-up uh, suit carriers that uh, zip down the middle? You put a dress suit inside, zip it up, fold it in half, and it attaches to an inbuilt coat hanger. That was where it was. On one side of that, a kind of um, a rectangular plate, very thin, but still with the pressed coke inside, with a 0 0.8 veneer, top and bottom, uh, a plastic seal on it, and a thin additional layer. What was that? One of those... Um, well, you'll see them on fridge magnets. It's kind of... Uh, magnetized uh, plastic mix and what was that doing there well I'll explain as I got a, I knew my airport I knew the trolleys that were for uh, used by passengers as I got off the plane and went to the luggage carousel I collected my suitcase and the suit carrier I held the suit carrier as I picked up a trolley I knew on the back of the trolley were some metal advertising um, well, boards, really. These riveted um, screens there advertised uh, car rental agencies or other services. But they were exactly the size of the piece of flat board that I'd attached to my suit carrier. And I had attached it so that it could be released on the, with the magnet side available to the back of the trolley. So as I sidled up to the back of the trolley, to where some people, and me that day as well, would hang their suit carrier, I was able to position the back of the suit carrier over the advertising placard that was part of the trolley. The magnet took effect, it held it in place, and I peeled it away from the suit carrier. It held on the inside the identical advertising that I knew to be a Charles de Gaulle airport. So it held its place. When I was pounced upon, taken away, they might have suspected me, had grave doubts about my luggage, but they paid no attention to the trolley. After all, it was theirs. There was nothing different about that. Any camera observation wouldn't have seen the way the panel attached itself to the back of the trolley. So after I was checked and loaded back up onto the same trolley and wheeled out into the foyer there and almost to the car park, 
well, certainly the ramp where the taxis were in this case, nobody thought anything. And I used the same suit carrier to peel it back off away from the magnets because that kind of flat magnet is not very strong, but just strong enough to hold my placard. And I think this goes to the point of what we like to think of as good standard smuggling, where it's deflection of distraction from the idea of what's going on, that you can survive a hit. We kind of rewarded each other with praise if your plan included something where you could be pounced upon and still get away with what you had. That was a fine thing when it worked. Of course, there's still quite a lot of, well, backyard engineering on that one. But it was something I've never heard of before. And I only mention it now because, well, in the pandemic era, airports have gone. Air, air smuggling is really, well, probably air cargo, but passengers? No. Personal use only, I guess. Which, in a sense, that thing was that day. So, ten objects. All still firmly in mind. So, how do I look back upon those ten smuggling objects of my career? Or the other ninety I haven't mentioned? Well, in a way, they haven't done anything more than teach me something about human beings and the way we look at things. Those devices don't really matter. And I guess there'll always be somebody coming up with something that, on the surface, seems smarter. After all, I knew somebody once who smuggled cotton buds. Yes, those little things that people should not poke in their ear. The thin plastic tube that held the bud at each end. That had been filled with a dissolved and then jellified liquid form of a drug. Oh, yeah, I know what you're thinking. It did take thousands upon thousands of those, packed and shipped, to make a significant enough quantity to make the whole thing worthwhile. And I, you can only imagine what it took to get the damn stuff out again, even if re-dissolved. It wasn't willing, <laughs> not willingly coming out of those tubes. So it was done, but it was a very clever idea, I suppose, if you had the, the setup for it. But that's not what really matters. And I can tell you how much it doesn't, because probably over a hundred people have come to me and said, David, I've got this brilliant idea for a concealment, a way of packing, a way of hiding something, this device nobody would look at. But do you know what? Everything I've been through and all the ideas that I've had have underscored and made clear that now these things do not matter. They might have to a degree once, but even then not terribly much. Back when I was starting out in the 70s, there was a technique at uh, London's Heathrow Airport. The officers there would be brought on board. The trainees would be set down at um, what was then Terminal 3 because it was where the long-haul flights from source countries came in. They would train the new officers not with techniques and, and a history of concealing, but on watching people. They would let him or her pluck uh, a number of passengers, check them out, and they'd get fines every so often. They'd, they'd find things. And so that officer would develop a kind of extra sense or really a training of the mind as to what kind of person would be a smuggler or a courier. That's what really counts, not the device itself. Indeed, I shouldn't say that one device saved my neck. It was one of the stereo tuners, and it was put in boxes inside the uh, actual electronics, and it wasn't easy to get into. At Heathrow, they didn't have the toolkit for it. They just couldn't get past the Allen keys. Uh, that in itself would have alerted me, but nonetheless they let me go with the damn thing because I was on one of those old um, 
European visitors' passports, they call them. It was a cardboard affair you bought for £10 at a at uh, a post office, and you could travel around Europe. So generally, smugglers didn't use those because they were no good for the long hauls. But their instincts were good, and they knew I was up to some mischief. Read my personal letters and dived on any vague drug references. Delayed me for an hour or so, and then followed me from the airport. Well, they let me go with the stuff, and that's the point. I was back in my element, got into a series of taxis, and then on the underground tube system and lost them. Three o'clock in the morning I was throwing stones up at a friend's place to let me in because I had a couple of kilos of dope hidden well. But <laughs> it, in that case the device saved me, but it doesn't get away from the point. So many people come up with these ideas for hiding things, but as interesting as they may be, and more and more, as modern times progress, it's the information on you as a person that counts. If there's none, it's suspicious. Go to line B. If there is information that's bad, it is more likely to be known. You think of the amount of information that goes into the airline computer systems before you travel now. That world has kind of gone with the Swiss watch. <laughs> yeah, you know, it wasn't the Swiss watch smuggler. It was actually the movements of Swiss watches that were smuggled in the 50s. Yeah, he's gone and so as the unknown passenger because all passengers are well known these days and if they're not, it's take a seat. We'll be with you shortly or longly, but you'll be here a while. And look too to how for example, Australian customs officers work. And, uh, and I think sometimes um, the American officers in certain... Well, I won't list the airports, but they work in the same way. Mm. Passenger gets off, something has flagged him, source country, number of trips, too many, too little. He sit aside. The customs officers start going through his bag, but there's always two of them. One opens the bag and looks at the contents. The other one looks at the passenger studies him. The first officer drops the lid of the suitcase onto his hand to see if it's too heavy. That's his tell layer. He lifts up every object and moves it to the empty side, the lid side of the suitcase. Gives it a cursory look, then picks up the next object, maybe the um, toilet bag, unzips it, pokes through it, zips it up, puts it aside. Meanwhile, the other officer is looking at the person, the traveller. Now, the officer who's doing the actual checking of objects simply does not have time to start hacking and chewing away at everyone. I guess unless you're in modern-day Sydney. But anyway, put their obsessions aside. <sighs> what he's really looking for is this. As each object is passed to the cleared side, the lid side, the passenger, the unwise courier, is looking on. I've always told them never to look. But anyway, he's looking on as Teddy is picked up, a little teddy bear, looked at, felt, put aside, and then on to the next object. Just at that point, the one looking at the face of the passenger sees that as Teddy made it to safety, as Teddy was put aside and declared fit for movement into the country, that's when the shoulders dropped. That's when the passenger seemed relaxed. That's when he started talking more about his travels and injected something other than blathering nonsense about taxi drivers and hotels. The officer watching the passenger will tap the one checking, meaning the very last thing you put aside was the thing that it's in. Here's the way it works. Information and the psychology of training. Now, there are some ways around that, but that's for another day. The world is changing to the point where the information you create that goes into your travel, the information that you allow into the system is what counts. If you want to be somewhere else, do something else, live a, a life unseen, to be able to do things that no one knows about, it is the creation of that person 
their Facebook presence, their Google checks, their every single movement which is logged. You've got to build that. You've got to create that. Air passengers who come out of nowhere are definitely going into line B. You may have some great objects, but they just will not get through the wall of the electronic fuzz, the narrowness of air travel. It doesn't matter. These are only the pitfalls for the independents. The big guys, it's all shipping. You won't see anything by air anymore. Really nothing but a few novices or old guys on the way out. I knew somebody used to earn a living as a humble, modest smuggler. When he saw those days came to an end, he ended his own life because he couldn't live any other way, or wouldn't, didn't want to, didn't feel right doing it, had a raging habit as well, but that's another thing. He knew he was no longer part of the old world, and he couldn't be part of the new one. Now, the times have changed, and our objects are going to mean less and less. And I think this applies to all objects. And the lesson is not to get too tied up with them. Think of where you fit in and how you present yourself. Not the idea of the superficial, the things concealed beneath the surface because they will always rise above there into visibility through your own personality. Something to take into account. Goodbye until next time. I'll make you feel miserable about something else.